Hello everyone, my name is James, and I'm developing a game called The Answer Is Never. As a single or lone developer, I found myself having to wrangle a tremendous amount of data. Sometimes that data are user interface textures, or 3D models, or materials, scripts, uh, audio files. But in this case, I wanted to specifically talk in this video about managing a library of art assets, namely models. In my game, I'm not using textures for any of the environment in the world. Uh, all of the textures that I will use are all in the front end or user interface, and everything in the world relies on a single material or two materials. One is reflective, one is non-reflective, and all objects share those single materials. And vertex coloring is where all of the properties and shading and all of that interesting stuff uh, comes from. Now, what I wanted to point out and uh, give a, hot, a spotlight on today was a tool that I found on the Unity Asset Store that saved me countless hours of manual work or batch work to produce visual icons or textures from all of the 3D assets that I have in my project currently. That um, tool is called Rapid Icon. We're going to look at that here in just a minute. Uh, if folks don't know about the game that I'm working on, it's called The Answer is Never. This is a action-adventure mystery game set in 1987 in Illinois in the United States. The protagonist or main character that you play as is a 15-year-old girl. Uh, this is a website that I created a few months back. It is very much a work in progress and needs to be updated. Uh, but there is some interesting stuff to look at here. Some of my early mock-ups of what the main menu in the game's logo would look like. Some of these early set pieces that I thought would be in the bedroom of the main protagonist character. Uh, but as you'll notice as we go through some of this art content and look through the actual Unity project, we'll see that the aesthetic or rendering of this project has tr changed in a pretty substantial way. And I'm very happy to move over in that aesthetic uh, because it greatly simplified the art approach and allows me to focus on the most important elements of this game, which is the choice-driven narrative and story. So as for wrangling all of this art content, this right here, which you're looking at, this big mess wall of text is how I've been wrangling in my mind all of the different art assets that I would need for these particular scenes in the game where story will take place. Some take place at the high school, some take place in the kitchen or living room of a home, the lake and forest. I wrote a few little bits of algorithm in here that tally up how many asset entries there are here, how many I have done, and that percentage left to do. It's a little depressing to see this as a single developer. But again, I do have resources as uh, in the form of contractors that I can intermittently hire to assist with this, but it's a lot. As we look through all of diff these different sheets in this uh, sheets document here, basically Microsoft Excel, we'll see how I'm tracking things like the living room where I'm checking off what we have, what we don't have, and this way I can do. But again, this is a wall of text. So the goal was to move towards a visual asset library where I could have this same view, but visually, and I could more easily filter through these and do a search across them for something specific. So if I needed a fruit bowl, like here's the fruit bowl, it belongs to the kitchen. So there is a connective layer here of metadata on where the fruit bowl belongs in the set dressing, right? Metadata. And so I wanted to connect this to an image and embed this metadata so that I could visually search for fruit bowl and know what I had in my asset library. So enter my asset tracking database. This is Visual Studio Code. Um, and this is basically an HTML web page. Over here on the left is the HTML code here with the typical divs and all of that stuff. There is uh, HTML, CSS, and some JavaScript here. I am using a library or framework called Isotope to do the layout, the filtering, and the sorting. And I'm actually just going to pull that up real quick. This is Isotope. It is a free-to-use uh, library or framework. Uh, if you're going to use it for a commercial product that you're going to launch and sell or monetize in some way, then you should probably pay for the commercial licensing on that. But I'm purely using it for internal tracking, never exposed to the public, never directly associated to anything that I'm going to deploy for sale. 
Um, and it's really cool. So in this case here, it's showing a periodic or element chart here. And this is the filter part. This is the sort part. I only have filtering functional in mine right now. So if I click rocks, we see all of the rocks that I currently have in my Unity project. If I click props, we see all of the props. However, there's no ability to really sort through these on the metadata that I was talking about before. For instance, if I have a city mailbox, which I have right here, I can sort of intuit that this is a city mailbox from the name, but not every name may be, not every naming convention may be this semantic where it says city mailbox. There may just be mailbox one, mailbox two, uh, sort of in the case of rocks, rock A, B, C, D. Some of these could be very tiny rocks that may be sitting inside of a planter in a home, in an interior. And some of these are massive rocks that'll be alongside of the edge of a forest or lake. So a bit of metadata layer there to explain that nuance is important, especially in something like the mailbox. There's going to be different types of mailboxes. There'll be mailboxes affixed to the front of a building. There'll be these large freestanding mailboxes. There'll be mailboxes that would be on a residential home on a front porch, not the same sort of mailbox. So if I do have a sort or filter, for a mailbox. I do need to have a bit of data there where I can filter towards mailboxes that would only be used on a home versus ones in a town. And I think that that's very important and that's where the sort will come in. So if we show just the metals, there we go. If we just show the transition materials, there we go. If we show just materials that in the name, they end in IUM, potassium, cadmium, calcium, we can filter. And it even gives you the code snippet to do that. You can show all the reset. Uh, the sort is the really awesome thing. So original order where it all originally was, you can sort by name. So that it looks like it's alphabetical. So we could do a sort by that. Um, you can also do a sort with this IUM. So we could do a, a input entry on my web application where you're looking for Bush and you type in B-U-S-H and it will find that, right? Um, this will sort by symbol. So the CD, the K, this is, this is really awesome. And then like the number, we can do a sort numerically on the number. So in my web application, maybe it's some form of just looking at a high level on how many rocks do I have? So I'm gonna sort based on a number, a quantity. Maybe I have three of rock B. And again, that metadata would be in this UI here layered over with maybe like a quantity number up here in the right hand corner. I envision that there'll be some kind of hover state that when I hover over this asset, the metadata will be right there for me to copy paste or right click. Uh, it will also be up here in somewhat of a drop down or a filter or an input box. I think there's going to be a drop down over here and an input box over here. This will allow me to not only know this is everything that I've completed in the Unity project so far out of the 150 assets, the 30 or 20 I have. So it lets me know what I've done. But it also lets me know what I have at my disposal. If I want to start propagating the player's bedroom, that's set. I know that I have her backpack, the hat, the alarm clock, a desk. I have a boom box. I have all kinds of interesting stuff for her room, but not quite enough. I can see that if I want to do the forest around the lake, I don't have what I need. I don't have the lily pads. I don't have the trees. And so this is a super helpful tool. Now, rapid icon is where I want to actually spend some of the focus in this video. It is a Unity Asset Store plugin by a developer named Patrick. Uh, I can't remember his name, Joe Patrick. And basically, these icons that I have here is able to produce these in just a minute, 60 seconds. Instantly produce these. I spent about 10 minutes just fiddling with them, sort of rotating them, adjusting the lighting on them. Uh, some of them I didn't touch and they look flat and a little dull. Again, they, they really communicate what they need to, so I don't need to spend too much time, but to go in my Unity project and go in my meshes folder here and figure out how to hook into the API and write code to iterate through an array or list of all of my FBX assets or prefabs and capture this thumbnail from this here and then get those exported out into a texture format that I can embed which I'd probably have to bring into Photoshop and run a batch on to crop at the resolution I need. This is all a royal pain. So I was looking at an automated quick way to grab an icon for every art asset I had in my Unity project and enter uh, Rapid Icon by Joe Patrick here. And I'll play a little clip 
of what he has going on here. Again, I'm not affiliated with this developer, I'm not connected in any way, I'm not paid to endorse. This is just something I came across last night. I did diligence on it. I tested it out for a while. I experimented with it. And I was really, it's not hyperbole to say, I was really blown away by how powerful something so simple was. You can see here that you can layer post processing over the images to layer like little images and textures. Uh, you can change the color. You can black out the icon. So if you have like a dull gray or blacked out silhouette of it for a locked icon, I think here there's, he's going to save presets. So you can save a preset that you can apply to all the icons. Um, it is insane. So I'm just going to demonstrate in real time uh, this in my project right here. So here we are at Marty's Roller Rink. This is one of the environments. This is where I'm keeping my um, models here under meshes right now. I'm going to get a little more granular and putting them into subfolders. But when you bring in the rapid icon you will bring this in from the unity package manager through your assets when you purchase it you will see the rapid icon at generator you download it there are pictures of the tool there are release docs here where you can read a little bit about it one of the gotchas on the tool is it does not support hdrp so if you're in an hdrp project it says it's not officially supported there was some testing done this developer does say if you have questions, get in touch and we'll be happy to help. I would reach out if you're in HDRP, but built in in URP is pretty much works for most of what I'm working on. And so there wasn't an issue there. Uh, I think the other limitation is the icons can only be up to 2K. So if you want to export out 4K, you would have to export out 2K and then use up upscaling uh, AI and maybe Photoshop, which could get you up to 4K very nicely. Uh, from a 2K, so there's always that option, but 2K I think is as big as that wheel, this tool will go. There is a documentation PDF in here and it's very light, very quick to import. It creates an asset menu up here called uh, Tools Rapid Icon. This is the main window. The utilities allow you to sort of clear out the cache on this because it does go through your project to generate those thumbnails and sort of saves out, I guess, a form of a cache. So you can just clear that out, all the rapid icon data and start fresh. And then you would just open the rapid icon window. Here it is. I usually will select my meshes folder, but they do have a handy dandy uh, project explorer over here that mirrors Unity's. And as you see, I just clicked that and there are all of my um, assets. This was super exciting for me last night. There are images of all of them and I was just blown away. Uh, you can also filter it by prefabs only. I have not turned any of them into prefabs. They're models only right now. But the great thing is, is you can do prefabs uh, where your mesh collision or your collider is already in there with your audio source and all of that. You can still capture an image of it. Uh, models only. And then you just go through your browser here and sort of select the asset that you want to fiddle with. By default, it's zoomed in substantially, so it looks a little... Uh, pixelated there, but I tend to use it at 100% because I want to see the actual final rendered resolution of that image. And here we go. We can also uh, cycle through some different stuff here. Uh, you can view it at quarter resolution, half resolution, full. Here's your zoom, uh, a scale to fit. I mean, that's probably ideal for some folks. You can um, move the object around here by adjusting these values. Um, you can just zero them out. Sometimes they come with Unity built-in offsets on them. Um, you can rotate the object, which is super powerful. This is really cool if you don't care for sort of that perspective of your icon. Uh, I'm going to show you something else in the camera tab here to get like an isometric, like if you just want a perfect isometric side view, like it's a schematic. You can do that. So let me reset my changes. So we have a handy dandy reset. You can reset all of these icons. You can do multi selections and perform the same exact thing on all icons, apply to all icons, reset all icons. Um, so let's see position auto. Yes. Rotation. Just obviously there's a scale. That's really awesome. I'll reset that. Let's go over to camera. Camera is super powerful. So rather than moving the object, now you can actually move the camera to the camera position will always have like a camera target on the asset. 
So that's really nice. It's almost like it's hooked directly to the uh, the asset or the camera target. So yeah, you can get oh, like a rear view, front view. This is so awesome. And then you can do a camera offset. Again, there's where you can do your orthographic or perspective. Sometimes to do perspective is just more simplified, right? And then just like, uh, sometimes it might be helpful just to manually type these numbers in, but so awesome, so awesome. You can see the power of that. So I'm just gonna reset that. Uh, lighting, another uh, super, super duper powerful one. Let me actually bring the asset in a little more and then so we can see the lighting change on it. I should have left that. Um, I'll just apply that, the camera setting to that. Let's go to the lighting. So if we think it's a little too dull, which it might be, it is set to like a default gray. We can brighten it up. We can actually darken it down if we want to dull it a little bit. But brightening it up is probably helpful. We look at that. It uh, There we go. Um, we can also do a color overlay on it. I mean, it probably doesn't show up super well over mine because I'm using a custom shader for the vertex coloring. Uh, there's very little contribution of real-time light, but there is a little bit of directional light contribution on my shader. But again, the effect's not going to be super intense because of the shading model that I'm using. Um, again, you can rotate the directional light. I zoomed in so that you can kind of see that effect. So if you want to get lighting from a certain direction on your asset, again, I'm using a custom cell shaded shader, so it's going to look different. Uh, you can dull it out, no lighting effect at all. In fact, without any lighting on at all, this is my, my assets still render because of the shader. But lighting will add a little bit of a contribution, so you can brighten it up. There you go. You can apply that. I'm just going to reset it. You can go to animation, which is awesome. I have had not had the time to uh, mess around with this yet, but I'm going to assume that this may allow you to export out a GIF or an animated icon that moves. Uh, this animation thing, I have no idea. I would recommend going on and looking at the documentation on the Asset Store page and see what that shows. Uh, this right here is the uh, post-processing aspect where you can layer over uh, basically a custom shader. And uh, I, again, I have not played with this. But again, if you want to do like a post-process effect over it where the whole thing is just a black silhouette, or maybe it's a rainbow, or maybe you're using a shader to blit uh, an image over it, like, you know, whatever you'd want, like a little logo of something for a brand name. I, I don't know, but super powerful. And you can just go in here and add custom shader passes over it to do all that stuff. And then the export part. So we're at uh, uh, 256. If we go back up to 512, let's go scale to fit. We see our res resolution is a lot better, um, but I don't need my icons to be that big. For my web application thing here, they're literally like 200 pixels, so they don't need to be very big. You can set the path where you want to uh, save this, and you can actually put a prefix or something before the name file name so you a underscore the file b and you can put something at the end of that file name and then you can change the name of the export and it'll actually tell you what that image is full export uh would be right um and for me it works that they use the actual name of the fbx i like that so what i might actually do here on the end is put a suffix of you know like I could just put FBX on the end to let people know that this is a render of an actual model. Or maybe there's some other signifier data that you want to do there. Um, it says PNG. I'm not sure if there are other export options on other than PNG. I'd have to look at the uh, I'd have to look at the um, the documentation. So I hit export. I'm going to close the window out. Again, if you set something on one of these, you can shift select and select all of them. Say you want to do some tweak to the dull lighting that's that way across all of the icons. Adjust that lighting intensity and then apply to all of them. And you'll see that every one of those just received a boost in lighting. So it's a batch process on all of them, which is awesome. And then you can go to export 
and you can export every one of those icons you had selected. But I just selected the one. So if we go to the right, I didn't change the path. So it's in exports and here it is. Um, I'll show an explorer and we'll just, uh, I don't want to open it with uh, Photoshop. So we'll just open it with photos. And the cool thing is that PNG, um, the tra it, transparent background, right? Now it does look like you may have to clean up a little bit of a mask fringe, but again, Photoshop allows you to do that. So if you have that, there is sort of a setting here for the controlling the border or the fringe on that. I'm trying to figure out, I'm wondering if that's PSD only. There's supposed to be one, but again, you could take that into Photoshop and edit that. I don't know if the tool um, allows you to adjust that masking around the edge. I'm going to assume that maybe there's something you can do here in the post-processing through the shader to grab those edges and do that. Pre-multiplied alpha. Hmm. I'll have to look at this. That might actually be the situation there that we need to... Uh, let me see if that makes a difference. Yeah, we'll replace that. Close that. Well, I'm already open. Um, yeah, look at that. Yeah, that fringe is either gone or greatly reduced. So yeah, it depends on kind of that default shader that is being used to post-process that. So yeah, there's no real noticeable fringe on that asset either. And again, you can control the background. Um, I'm curious to know if there are other formats that aren't PNG that have a solid fill background that you can do. But again, he did demonstrate in the asset store page that you can put a background in there via, I don't know if that was in the camera tab or the shader tab. So you could fill it with a texture or a solid color or something like that. Anyway, uh, thank you for watching. Like and subscribe if you feel like you want to see more of this stuff. And I hope that this was helpful.